Hello everyone. Today I have to talk about a very important disease uh, which is uh, known as echinococcosis or the high cyst disease. Uh, in this disease people would develop such kind of balls filled with fluid inside their lungs, a liver, or other vital organ. And if the cysts are developed, if the in infection is mostly asymptomatic and people would not come to know about the infection for years and years unless the cyst is very large in size so uh, in that condi uh, condition when the cyst uh, is undetectable or you are not feeling sy symptoms of the disease the cyst uh, would become very large in size and at that particular state there is no other treatment rather than to go for surgical removal of the cyst. So people uh, who have cysts would undergo very invasive surgical procedure. For instance, you can undergo cardiothoracic surgery for removal of the cyst if, uh, from your lungs or abdominal surgeries for removal of the cyst from your intestines or liver or other organs or spleen. And this cyst can interfere with the function of your lungs by blocking vital passages or the cyst can block vital passages of your liver the bile ducts and other uh, cases causing uh, causing jaundice and other condition uh, what is causing this condition it's a parasite okay there are different species echinococcus brain losses and echinococcus multilocularis are more common among them and where is the parasite uh, coming from? The parasite is coming from this species, the dogs. These are the definitive hosts. So people who are keeping uh, these uh, dogs as pets are the dogs roaming about in your streets as stray dogs. All these are involved in the transmission cycle. They can transmit this particular parasite to human beings and other animal species. Uh, what are the other animal species involved in the transmission cycle? Uh, these are all the animals that you can see around, okay? These include these uh, goats, uh, the sheep, uh, buffaloes, calves, uh, pigs, uh, camel, horses. So all these animals are involved in the transmission cycle. All the other animal species are not transmitting the parasite uh, into the human population but the dogs are doing it, okay? And dogs are very popular. Sometimes we have very intimate relationship with dogs. That's why we, uh, people keep, uh, who are keeping dogs uh, as pets or farming, uh, people who are doing farming of dogs are people who are living in close proximity to uh, dog farms, for instance, commercial farms of dogs are people who are uh, you know doing a lot of outing and uh, they are just going outside you know laying down there on the lawns and in the lawns and uh, different wild areas they should be uh, careful and they should take uh, great care because the transmission of their, their this particular parasite uh, is very easy is uh, just from hand to mouth. So if your hands are contaminated, you can just ingest the eggs uh, into your uh, mouth and you can contract this particular condition. So this is a very important condition. Uh, and I hope you guys who are having some kind of association with different kind of animal species would particularly uh, be very cautious and they will listen to this presentation in order to prevent, uh, to take preventive measures and to stop the uh, transmission of this parasite into the human population. So a kind of cocosis is a neglected tropical disease. This, this is what uh, the World uh, Health Organization is telling about the disease. Okay, the World Health Organization has included this particular condition in the list of diseases which are known as neglected tropical diseases. They are called neglected tropical diseases because not a great deal of research effort 
has been directed against this condition, although the burden of the disease in uh, around the world, especially in agriculture countries where people are uh, r relying on herd keeping, sheep herds or goat herds or cattle herds or uh, dogs and these things are kept uh, for different purposes. So in those countries, this particular condition is quite common. But as I told you in the first slide that it's uh, asymptomatic in many conditions, it can go unnoticed for years unless and until it uh, would reach to a point where it would cause a serious condition. And uh, only then people would come to know about it. Or some people would come to know about this particular condition quite accidentally. They would go into different hospitals and undergo these imaging techniques, X-ray, MRI, or CD scan, and they would find out that there is sometimes some, some kind of cyst in their body, in their lungs, or in other organs. And then uh, they would undergo these invasive surgical procedures for the removal of these hydrated cysts, which are very painful and very risky. So hydatidosis is a parasitic zoonotic disease, okay? Uh, it's caused by the parasite, it's called zoonotic because it is transmitted from animals to human beings. And uh, it is caused by uh, which parasite? It's a cystode, a tape one, uh, which is known as a kind of focus of granulosis, multilocularis, or other species that we will just talk about in the next slide. Uh, the genus is a kind of focus. This is, for instance, uh, uh, the picture of a kind of focus of granulosis. So, the tapeworm belonging to the platy helminths is causing this particular condition. Uh, the family is Taniidae, and the genus uh, is a kind of focus. There are currently nine species in this genus. Uh, these out of these nine species, these five species, Echinococcus granulosus, Echinococcus multilocularis, uh, Echinococcus uh, vogelic, Echinococcus oligarthrus, Echinococcus sucigus are important with respect to uh, the zoonotic transmission of the virus or transmitting this particular uh, pathogen or the parasite on uh, over to human beings. Uh, a great deal of the disease is caused by a kind of focus grain losses among the human beings and other animal species, followed by a kind of focus multilocularis. Okay. Uh, if you look at this structure here, this is a kind of focus uh, grain losses, and there are two distinct parts of this adult a kind of focus grain losses. One is the scolex. Okay. And the other is called strobella. Uh, from here to here, this is strobella. And from here to here, this is called the scolex. So the scolex has different structures, just like the hooklet, sucker, and neck. And the hooklets are important for infectivity. When this parasite would infect a particular person, this parasite would go inside and this hooklet would just, uh, you know, attach to the intestinal mucosa and would enter into the uh, mucosa. Uh, so these are important with respect to infectivity. And then there are three different types of proglottids making strobella. Uh, first, uh, the scolex is attached to immature proglottid and means the germinal mass is not mature here. The germinal mass is mature here. These are the mature uh, mature proglottids, which contains testes and the uterus. And the testes and the uterus, these are Im uh, important with respect to, uh, you know, uh, this particular uh, fertilization of ova, the gametes formation and fertilization of ova. And the third proglottid is called the gravid proglottid. It is called gravid because the ova or the eggs are present in this proglottid. So that is the structure of this particular organism. Uh, there are little differences when you look at the structure uh, and, uh, and compare it across species. What are the organs where this particular uh, uh, parasite can develop cyst? The cyst can look like this. You know, it's a big cyst uh, being surgically removed from a patient here. So such kind of cyst can be developed inside the lungs, 
uh, inside the liver. These are the most probable or most common sites for the development of the cyst. Most commonly in the liver, followed by lungs, okay? And the cyst can also be formed inside your brain, inside your eye, inside the intestine or the kidneys. So in all these organs, when the cysts are developed, these vital passages of the organs are blocked, okay? Uh, so your air passages may be blocked here. Your bile ducts may be blocked here. So the functions of liver or lungs may be disturbed. Here, your entire uh, you know, brain can be uh, inflamed as a result of this particular cyst. The eye or the kidneys can be inflamed as a result of development of the cyst. So uh, these are just a few organs. This cyst can be developed in many different types of organs inside your body and cause different conditions as they grow. The growth rate is slow, one to three centimeter per year, but once they grow, they, uh, you know, into mature cysts, they can cause serious problems. Uh, cyst types in the body, if you just are uh, talking about its uh, physical appearance, that how would these appear? So these may be a different kind of uh, cysts uh, in a singular form. We call them unilocular cysts. All the unilocular cysts also can uh, vary morphologically you some would be pomegranate shaped some would be apple shaped and other shapes okay and uh or the cysts may be formed uh, as multiple balloons filled with water and these balloons are called multilocular cysts okay generally we divide the cyst into four different types uh, based on the architecture of the cyst uh, the type one cyst, they have simple they are simple cyst with no internal architecture. Type two are cysts which have developed daughter cysts inside. The type three cysts are dead cysts. Uh, they are calcified stress uh, cysts. The, the cysts may be calcified in some conditions in some people. In type four cysts, they are complicated cysts or uh, rupture cysts. Sometimes the cyst may rupture and protoscolysis may be released and they would cause cyst formation uh, and more cysts will be formed inside your body. So uh, if you look at the structure of the cyst closely, you would see that it is composed of three distinct membranes. Uh, one membrane is to the outer side. This is called the pericyst. In this pericyst or the outer membrane, it is vascular in nature and it contains different kind of host cell. Who is the host? The host is the particular person in which the parasite has entered and now the parasite is trying to make a nest for itself or the cyst for itself, okay? So different kind of fibroblasts and other cells, they would uh, uh, come here and they uh, would make uh, this particular pericyst or the outer wall of the cyst, which ha which is vascular, vascular mean it has got these blood vessels, okay? So this is the host tissue outside, followed by another membrane, which is in the middle. Uh, this uh, membrane is called the laminated membrane. Where is this membrane coming from? It's not a host tissue. This is actually coming out of the third layer, which is known as the germinal layer, uh, the third layer is secreting this particular layer, which is known as the laminated layer. It is acellular. It means there is no cell here. They are just uh, uh, laminated hyaline layer, connective tissue layer, and it is only passing the nutrients from this vascular layer to the internal side or the germinal layer of uh, this particular cyst. So what is happening in the germinal layer the germinal layer, the germinal layer is the third and innermost layer, and this uh, layer is not only uh, giving rise to the larval stages of the parasite, which are known as the scolosis, uh, that you can see the scolosis are the larvae of this particular parasites coming out of this germinal layer. Uh, it is uh, also giving rise to this laminated membrane. 
are this membrane which is responsible for the passage of the nutrients to the inner side. The nutrients are required here for the germination of these colluses are the larval stages of the parasite, and that's why it's called the germinal layer. Okay, so these colluses uh, then uh, would develop into protoscolluses, and these daughter cysts, which are developed inside the cyst, uh, they have these protoscolluses, which may be released as a result of, uh, you know, rupture. If the cyst is ruptured, these protoscolluses may be released, and they can cause cyst formation in other organs. Otherwise, this cyst would just grow larger and larger in size with the passage of time. So initially, when somebody is infected, the cyst is not enclosed in this particular membrane. It is recognized by your immune cells. There's a lot of immunological repertoire against this particular uh, parasite. And the cyst, after some time, as it grows, uh, after some time, the cyst would uh, uh, you know, develop these other structure, the pericysts or this host uh, membrane around the parasitic membranes here. And this structure, uh, the hydrated cyst would remain there inside the bodies of animals for year and year, unless and until they are big enough to cause problems in vital organ. What are the signs and symptoms that uh, people would come to know about whether they are, they are infected or not. This depends upon the size and location of the hydrated cyst. The patients are asymptomatic and the incubation period may be in years. In patients where the cyst is in a location which is not in close proximity to a particular uh, vital organ, for instance, or some nerves, they would not feel uh, if they have this particular cyst inside, and as I told you, many people would be diagnosed quite accidentally. They would be in the hospitals to diagnose some other conditions, but uh, when they look at their images, CT scan, MRI, or X-ray reports, they would find out that they have something inside their lungs, their liver, or abdomen, other structures in, uh, in, in their abdomen, and then they would come to know about it uh, because of this asymptomatic nature, okay? Uh, symptoms would develop when uh, the cyst would become bigger and it would exert pressure in, on different organs. So uh, nausea, weight loss, and weakness are general symptoms. Some people can uh, experience these symptoms in lots of different, uh, other different conditions. Uh, if the cyst is uh, growing near the liver, the patient may have abdominal pain or nausea and vomiting. These would be frequent in some people. And these people would also develop obstructive journals. Uh, so the journals, uh, this condition, uh, paling of uh, their skin or eyes as a result of obstruction in uh, the vital passages of the liver, the bile ducts, etc., as a result of the cyst formation, are symptoms of this particular condition. If the cyst is developing inside the lung, uh, there will be a chronic cough and chest pain and shortness of breath. Now, people would ask that these are signs of COVID-19 because uh, people are experiencing these system, uh, symptoms frequently in COVID-19. So the COVID in COVID-19, the coronavirus is affecting the lungs uh, in a similar way. Uh, this particular parasite is also affecting your lungs. So it definitely uh, uh, shortening a breath or the cough. These are uh, the signs or symptoms that there is something wrong with your lungs. So uh, this is something in common between COVID-19 and uh, people who are infected with echinococcus veinosus or multilocalitis. They would exhibit similar kind of symptom. What happens if the cyst ruptures? And why would the rupture take place? Rupture of the cyst naturally are by taking the sample may lead to anaphylactic shock. The cyst may be ruptured sometimes naturally some uh, uh, accidentally or uh, as a result of some kind of trauma, the cyst would be ruptured. And this cyst, uh, the protoscolosis will, would be released 
uh, and they would be free to make other cysts inside your body. It's a kind of malignancy or a cancerous type of situation developed uh, as a result of this rupture. And the prognosis of people who undergo this kind of uh, rupture of cyst is very poor and they usually don't survive. And uh, that's why doctors are taking great care when they are doing cystectomy or excision of the cyst uh, from the body. So uh, it can also take place as a result of procedure where you are taking biopsies from the cyst. The cyst may be ruptured and these protoscolases may be released. And apart from this, that these protoscolases would develop many other cysts inside your bodies, uh, they can also cause anaphylactic shock inside the body. Uh, because uh, this is not uh, the primary exposure now, you were primarily exposed to this particular parasite when you were infected first. And that's why the cyst is here because you were infected a long time ago and your body's defense system has worked against us previously. And you know about the defenses against the parasites. I have uh, shared separate lectures on the defenses against parasites in immunology lectures, you can go through that. The parasitic responses are Th2 helper type two cell responses are IgE uh, responses because aminoglobulin E is released and the cells that are involved in this process are eosinophils, basophils and mast cells. So all these different kind of things are also involved in hypersensitivity reactions or allergies. So parasitic immunity is actually, um, these mechanisms are similar to uh, uh, allergic mechanism or hypersensitivity mechanisms. So if many parasites are released at the same time inside your body, then it would lead to anaphylactic shock or severe hypersensitivity as a result of secondary exposure because your body is well acquainted of this parasite, you were exposed, the body has got the memory of that parasite, and now uh, this, your body would respond more quickly and more uh, with, with, with more power because of that memory and that more power will lead to uh, this anaphylactic shock in your body as a result of extensive degranulation of the mast cells, these eosinophils and basophil destroying uh, a lot of tissues and organs inside. So what are the hosts, you know? Before discussing the host, I would just uh, tell you that the parasites are very smart. They have been evolving for billions and billions of years, and they are very smart, you know? They are looking at different species. They are looking at the behavior of different species, how different animal species are interacting with each other, and how to utilize this knowledge of interaction of different species for its own survival. So the parasite definitely have studied this particular aspect that how long these different animal species are in connection to each other, how much they are interdependent, and how long human being is, uh, you know, in association with these species. So uh, what is, uh, the parasite has found a perfect cycle here uh, by utilizing all these different animal species. The definitive host is the dogs. The, it is called the definitive host because the parasite is developing into an adult uh, parasite or it achieves adulthood here in the dogs. Our infectious parasites are formed inside the dogs and they are released along with the feces into the gardens, into the open areas, wherever these stray dogs or pet dogs are, you would find uh, these, uh, you know, over all the parasites which would be infective for other animal species grazing on this grass are human beings who are laying down on this grass. Our kids who are playing on this grass can come in contact uh, with these eggs. They can ingest it. These eggs can, uh, you know, remain here. They are quite stable for, uh, for, for more than an, a year. These eggs would stay there in the environment 
and they would not undergo this uh, desic desiccation, although they are prone to it, but it takes a lot of time. And they would stay there viable, infectious, and when these guys, other animal species, the camels, the horses, uh, these cows, the pigs, goats, and uh, the buffaloes, including the human beings, they come in contact with these ova, they will be infected and they will develop this particular condition. So it's a very serious condition that these species actually are developing. Human being is the dead host because human being cannot pass on this particular parasite to other human beings or other animal species. And these animal species, the parasite would develop into cysts and these protospolices. Again, when these cysts, or when these animals are slaughtered and their offals are uh, just uh, thrown in the open, these offals, uh, uh, the stray dogs and other dogs, they uh, would feed on these offals and uh, the, the protospolices again would enter into the body of the definitive host and uh, the remaining of the cycle would be completed here. Adult infectious particles would be produced inside the dogs again. So the dogs are important here as definitive host because they are the main culprits. They are transmitting this uh, parasite not only to all many different kind of animal species but also to human beings. It's not only the dogs, other uh, uh, things like the foxes or uh, the wolves or the bush dogs, all these are also important. But we have a population, more population of dogs here. If you look at the population of dogs around the world, it is about 10% of the human population. So it means that it's a lot of population uh, of dogs. 10% is a big uh, percentage, a large percentage. And 75% of these 10% uh, that we are talking about, 75% of them are stray dogs. It means these stray dogs would, uh, are, are free to go there, feed on the offals of the animals or the waste of the animals, which can contain these different kind of parasites. Uh, and the cycle would be continued. You would have more infectious parasites or ova in the environment, uh, and this condition would become more prevalent in that particular setting or that particular area. So if you look at this, this is a perfect combination, all in one. I have captured, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just copied this picture from the internet. Uh, so uh, because it's a perfect combination, you can see all the three things here. Uh, the human being is here, animals are here, and the dogs are here. You would have seen dogs accompanying different herds. So this makes a perfect combination. This is the definitive host. These are the intermediate hosts that you see here. So if these are infected and some sheep dies here, uh, this dog is definitely going to have a feast, uh, feed on the offals because cysts are generally removed out of the body of animals and they are thrown outside in the open environment because people think they are not good to eat. Uh, they are not something to eat. That's why the dog should eat it and the dogs would eat those cysts and they would pass on feces and all around here. So this man can also come in contact with the ova passed into the feces, uh, through the feces of this particular dog. And these other animals uh, which were not infected would also come in contact with uh, those oa and developed cysts. So uh, this condition would be developed if all the three hosts are present here and they are, uh, uh, you know, um, contributing towards this particular transmission. Okay. Uh, e granulosis, a kind of corpus granulosis, as I told you, uh, is uh, most frequently involved in causing condition in human beings and animal species. Most of the infections are due to the kinocobus granulosis. Uh, it's called a cystic form uh, of the disease and the cysts are usually unilocular as you can see here. And as I told you about the asymptomatic nature of the disease, 
uh, so the disease may be asymptomatic if the cyst is uh, found in a location where uh, vital organs, it's away from the vital organs. Incubation fear, it may range from months to 30 years. So it's a long time that people would not come to know about their infection, the state of their infection. The growth rate is quite slow, one to three centimeters per year. So it's very slow growing thing. Uh, and slowly and gradually as it grows, it would press other organs and would develop different kind of uh, symptoms. The cyst location in 60 to 70 percent in case of e granulosis is inside the liver. In 20 to 25 percent of cases, the cyst is formed inside the lungs. Uh, then there is a kind of focus multi loculase that is causing alveolar form of the disease uh, and it is causing multi locular cysts, as you can see here. The cysts are usually found in the liver and cysts not, are not enclosed within the membrane. They invade surrounding tissues and disease is progressive and malignant. In human beings, uh, you know, many cases are caused by the kinococcus multilocularis. Uh, it's uh, a very important uh, pathogen with respect to human beings as well. Uh, if you look at the genotypes of echinococcus uh, granulosis, uh, there are three genotypes, G1, G2, and G3, uh, which are collectively called echinococcus granulosis sensostrictor. This is a single name for all these three different types of genotypes of echinococcus granulosis. And they have a host, uh, sheep or buffalo. G3 resides in buffalo, it's called a buffalo strain. G1 and G2 are called sheep strain because they have been isolated from sheep and they live here on sheep. All these species can infect uh, other animals or human species, species as well. But uh, this is uh, just about the classification uh, on the basis of uh, these different genotypes, on the basis of the similarity, similarities that they have. Although this is still debatable and uh, people are working in this area to properly classify different genotypes or species of the kinococcus. Uh, G4 is found in horses, it's called the kinococcus equinus. Uh, G5 a genotype uh, is found in cattle, uh, it's called the kinococcus oslepi. Uh, it's similarly from G6 to G10. Uh, these genotypes of echinococcus granulosis are found in camels, pigs, and other cervides, and all these are called echinococcus canadensis. So canadensis, ovulopi, equinus, and echinococcus granulosis, uh, sensu stricto, uh, these are the species name, and these are the strains, or genotypes that we are talking about. Uh, in uh, the case of echinococcus. So here you have uh, the strain, here you have uh, the host species for the strain, here you have these uh, species. The species echinococcus granulosus sensu stricto, which contains these three genotypes uh, from G1 to G3, similarly echinococcus uh, equinus, it's a uh, single strain G4 found in horses, Orlipi, uh, it's a single strain found in cattle, uh, we call it G5 genotype. Uh, similarly, the Echinococcus canadensis uh, is found in pigs, uh, canadensis are from G6 to G10, these different genotypes that we are talking about from G6 to G6, they are belong to, the, uh, they are the same species, the kind of focus canadensis. So uh, that is uh, enough for today. Uh, so I would be talking about uh, the rest of the presentation, which include uh, different kind of uh, diagnostic procedures and the transmission cycle that how, uh, you know, 
the life cycle of this particular parasite is and how it is transmitted, I would be talking about uh, the, those aspects in the next presentation. Thank you very much for watching this. Thank you so much.